three minutes to each candidate first to, uh, to Leslie. If elected, how would you address the following topic? Domestic terrorism. Three minutes. Interesting one to choose. Domestic terrorism is not something that people discuss much on the road in the 5th District. Um, of course, with my background, I have uh, spent a great deal of time thinking about terrorism. I'm one of the people who first uh, broke the story of the Arab Mujahideen in Peshawar, in Pakistan, and Afghanistan many, many years ago. Domestic terrorism uh, embraces both uh, a couple of other subjects that are important to think of. One is, it folds over, if it's an American, involved in domestic terrorism, it tends to fold over into gun issues. Uh, we have Parkland, we have hundreds, we've had over 200 uh, incidents in 2018 alone. Um, most of the time, uh, even if it's a large number of people who've been killed, the word terrorism doesn't get used unless you have a background, perhaps, um, Islamic terrorism is what we tend to think of. However, domestic terrorism, I would, I would talk about guns. And uh, what I would say is this. This is something that is of great concern to the people in the 5th District, and it has to do with assault weapons, it has to do with large capacity magazines, it has to do with uh, what we're talking about terrorism, like the uh, um, terrible murders in a church in Texas. It has to do with people who are guilty of domestic violence at home, and therefore they then get involved in larger massacres. In fact, over 50% of the massacres that we are seeing are people who have are guilty of domestic violence. Um, my feeling about these kinds of incidents are in Congress, we can do a great deal to legislate this. One, we can close gun show loopholes, we can close boyfriend loopholes for domestic violence offenders. We can uh, close, uh, we can make sure that bump stocks are not available. I was just reading long accounts from the police in Baltimore who um, have had a lot of trouble being outgunned by people with bump stocks. And we can think about the assault weapons ban of 2018 and whether that should be considered and signed, and I would add my name to the assault weapons ban in 2018. Um, in terms of uh, 20 more seconds, but I would also say that the, that the uh, Muslim ban helps nothing in this regard, that what happened on 9-11 had nothing to do with people from those countries selected. Yeah, that's an interesting topic, how to start off. My, uh, my training actually does have something to do with terrorism. Um, my background is actually counterterrorism, but it's also counterterrorism mission management. Most of mine, though, was directed outside of our borders, which was international terrorism. But I know a little bit, based on some of the stuff that I've done with DHS, on the JTTF, which is the Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, but also on HVEs, which are homegrown violent extre extremists. The definition of the FBI for domestic terrorism, and sorry, it's just something I know fairly well. Uh, the definition for domestic terrorism is anybody, really, who weaponizes uh, their political party, their political leanings, where they weaponize it in a way that causes violence on somebody else to change the direction of the country or to threaten the United States. And I think what we've seen in the polarization of America right now is everybody is sort of weaponizing their political views for violence towards others. Domestic terrorism, when you look at it, and you can look at it for anything, you know, all the way from 95 to McVeigh, um, even to um, people killing others based on their belief systems, killing police officers, based on, I think it was two in Texas who actually shot two police officers because they were gonna start a revolution uh, for anarchy in America. Those are all definitions of do domestic terrorism. And law enforcement, when you're looking at it from a terrorism side and how you actually target these types of groups, the things that we see and the weaknesses we see in the dom domestic terrorism arena are actually data collaboration, people not sharing, right? Even in federal agencies, they compete against each other for pots of money in order to do certain things, and sometimes they don't even want to share data. 
So what I work on right now in the Pentagon and the things that I do is actually data sharing technologies to help with collaborative data across agencies to stop these groups from infiltrating the United States. When I say inf infiltrating, they're infiltrating from within. HVEs were originally meant to talk about those who were engaged in global jihad. Now HVE is morphing to anybody engaged in violence against all of us. If anybody uses violence to further a political cause, that definition is domestic terrorism. And at some point in law enforcement and what we do here, it's based on education. <laughs> uh, I don't want to sound savvy, it's sort of based on loving each other and what we have in this great republic. But it's also based on making sure we support law enforcement, but also support the new technologies that will help us with data collaboration and help us to actually do the actionable intelligence we need in order to make sure that we ferret out, we identify, and we corral these domestic terrorists. Thank you. This next question goes first to, uh, to Denver. Um, if elected, what would your priorities be with respect to foreign policy? Three minutes. Well, there's a lot going on right now in the country. Um, you know, when you look at what happens today, right, you're looking at, um, you talk at foreign policy, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the NIPF or the national intelligence priorities that you look at every day, right? So through the NIPF, if you're looking at the priorities um, in the intelligence community and also in the operational community, you're looking at multiple countries that we have to look at for insurgency activities, you know, hegemonic interests, which you're talking about maybe Russia trying to apply pressure in Syria to support the Assad regime. But let's just go over some of the things that are happening right now, right? You have the Paracels and the Spratleys in the South China Sea. What's going on there, right? Force projection. We're trying to use diplomacy to make sure that we can keep those straits open. But you're talking about 18 to 30 islands that are being militarized. And I can't give you the exact number for many reasons. You're looking at a South China Sea issue where we have a massive power like China that's trying to take territory. Let's go over to Libya. Libya right now, you have insurgents. You have ISIS insurgency happening in Libya right now. And you're like, well, why in the heck are they back in Libya? Because they're actually looking at the oil pipelines in Libya because Libya nationalized that oil. So they're trying to cut off the oil supplies. And there might only be seven or 750 in that area. But what they're doing is they're trying to alter right, any type of pricing regimes and to have a big sort of here we are again in Libya. Let's go to Syria. We just had a plane shot down by Russian equipment, right, by Syrian forces. And now we see them trying to sort of dance around each other so that they won't escalate with the awful things that are happening there. Let's go to Yemen. We have Iranian-backed insurgents for the Houthis, and we have multiple groups that are working in there right now to try to destroy others. Multiple groups and multiple things that are happening. So let's go somewhere else. Let's go to our own borders. Let's look at drug interdiction and the things that we have there. So when you're looking at foreign policy, when you're looking at global politics, you have multiple hegemonic powers that are trying to do things to us that we have to react to. We have to react to that either with force, soft diplomacy. When I say hard diplomacy, there's something I always agree with in global politics. It's something I agree with when it comes to diplomacy. You walk softly and you carry a big stick. I used to be a bouncer. And let me tell you, now I know I was the shortest bouncer in the history of bouncers, but I was. <laughs> because if I snuck up on them, I could bite their knees. But the thing that we have is this. Because I was a short bouncer, and I had somebody I had to get out of there, and I had to diplomatically use soft diplomacy, to get them out of the door before they tried to beat on somebody because they had had too much of that uh, liquid courage. I always had four big bouncers behind me. And that's what you have behind you, my friends. You have the United States Air Force. You have the United States Navy. You have the Marine Corps, right? You have the United States Army. But you also have the full faith of the United States government. So when I look at global policy, it's based on the priorities that come down from the National Command Authority, how you direct those priorities, and how you make sure that funding is directed to those priorities without the waste that we sometimes see in the government. Thank you very much. Right now, this administration has done so much damage to our alliances abroad that the repair job is going to be absolutely enormous. Talk to anyone who works or worked in the State Department. Half the people there with real expertise have been fired or have left in disgust. There are tumbleweeds in the halls of the State Department. Our allies in Europe are asking, what is wrong with Washington? 
Our allies in Asia are asking, what is wrong in Washington? We have really, really gotten ourselves into terrible, terrible trouble. So what I look forward to in going into Congress if I am asked to in any way participate in foreign affairs, is to try and repair this damage. Having covered so many, as I said, I've covered stories in 50, over 50 countries. I know the Middle East well, I know South Asia well, I know Africa well, parts of it. And um, to be able to um, restore the alliances, to be able to hire back the people who um, have some expertise, to be able to shift the decision on who starts a war. Constitution, the Constitution says this is Congress's right. Let's give it back to Congress. It's not the right of the President of the United States. It is Congress. And the fact that we do not respect that at the moment, that, that Congress has not seized that right, means that we have a series of endless wars. Endless wars which this country cannot afford at the moment. Right now, we're putting the cost of the wars on a credit card. <laughs> Afghanistan alone, according to my friend John Sopko, who's the Inspector General, has said it's nearly a trillion dollars so far, and we're not winning that war. A war that has gone on for 17 years. There are big problems that need repair, but, but mostly what we have to do is bring back good sense to our, um, to our foreign policy. And uh, there are many things that can be done in the Middle East. Um, Yemen is indeed a favorite country of mine. I have lots of ideas of what to do in Yemen. I probably, when I get to the Hill, will be um, buried deep in the Agriculture Committee and not thinking about foreign policy. But we have grave problems and they need to be addressed. <laughs> Leslie, first to answer the next question, three minutes each. What would you do if elected to address health care in America? Healthcare is by far the most important issue in the 5th District of Virginia. I, you know, having started this 16 months ago, I have heard more about healthcare than you could possibly imagine. But there are several pieces of this that need to be addressed. One, we've just seen in Charlottesville, because Trump pulled out the subsidies from under the insurance companies, we ended up with a monopoly. So suddenly insurance for a family of four on the individual market costs $36,000 a year with a $12,000 deductible. 23% more than anywhere else in the United States, including the Aleutian Islands. What to do about that? First of all, we need to restore the Affordable Care Act, we need to restore the subsidies, we need to restore the individual mandate. Without the individual mandate, over 10 years, 13 million people will not be covered. Um, all of that needs to be restored. Beyond that, we have critical issues in the fifth with people who are splitting their pills in half because they cannot afford their medication. I, every day, I run into someone who cannot afford their diabetes medication, who cannot afford the medication for severe migraines, for cancer, for everything. We have a crisis here. We need to negotiate with Big Pharma. We need to negotiate hundreds of billions of dollars with Big Pharma. <coughs> and in some estimates, it goes up to 2.5 trillion over 10 years, if we pay the same prices as the Europeans. I would like to be on the Oversight Committee, haul Big Pharma in front of me, and do those hearings in, a, in the same way I would do a 60 minute story. Because this is an outrage. The VA negotiates prices, Medicare doesn't. Why not? It's completely political. There is no rhyme or reason behind it and that has to be changed. Also, we have an opioid plague. We have it in Madison and we have it in the whole district. 
So I have gone and spent a lot of time looking at treatment programs because the, the federal government has money for opioids, but you have to put it in the right place. You can't throw it at treatment programs where, um, uh, you know, 28 days you're in and out and you're back on the street. We need treatment programs that are run by recovering addicts because they understand what needs to be done. You need eight, eight months. You need a lot of help with getting back into, uh, into, the, um, into society. Thank you. I think um, it's interesting. I actually believe in healthcare that Leslie and I probably agree on a few things. I would say number one, I think it's one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now. I think also just based on, I think we both see the problem. I just also think there's a polarization on the issue in healthcare. You know, I don't think we need an Obamacare. I don't think we need a Trump care. I almost think we need a bipartisan care. Let me explain. When we hired our employees uh, starting about four years ago, We've seen a steady growth, a massive growth in the premiums that we're paying at Silverback. Um, we never really saw that when I when I had my DoD companies, and we knew it was because of Obamacare. So we're like, why, you know, why are we having to go through this? When the Republicans came into office, they did a fantastic job of screwing up. So now we have Democrats who broke it and Republicans who kept it broke, and that's how I look at it. And why do I look at it that way? It's because it's taken so much individual individual choice away from us. We see tax bills rising and rising. If you look at Medicare and Medicaid right now, we're spending $1.3 trillion. And if we talk about what's happened to the VA right now, that's 7 million people in the VA. If that's the kind of health care that you want, and when you see how our veterans have been treated, that is what my fear is of making complete government-run health care. So after the debate, I started reading about different things. And I don't have to talk politically here. We can talk about health care. It seems to me, look at what happened in Britain with the NHS. They started to actually increase private health care. In other areas, they started to increase government-aided health care on more free market systems. And what I'm starting to see is there needs to be some kind of compromise between government health care and things that we agree with in Obamacare. And I have to tell you, we have pre-existing conditions in our family. I agree with that. I agree our children are 26, 24, and 21. It helped us when they were going through college to be able to have them on a policy. But the flip side of that is there's such out of control spending that you sort of have, and it's a song, and, now, and you sort of have lobbyists on the left of you and bureaucrats on the right, right? And here, here I am stuck in the middle with you. So you have this massive spending that's coming out, and people say, we just gotta put more money, we've gotta put more money. But you got Medicare and Medicaid that have awful cost associated with fraud. You have the VA that can't get out of its own way, that's why they had to sign the VA Choice Bill. So what I'm asking here is this, here's what I'm gonna do. And I think this is where Leslie agree on the problem. I just don't think we agree on the solution. I think there needs to be some kind of congressional binding resolution in the next five years that we solve the health care crisis and we try to get out of this partisan bickering of either the government taking care of everything or the free market taking care of everything. Because all of us know we're not going to get rid of Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security. All of us know because we have parents, grandparents, even us. My wife and I were on Medicaid when we went to the University of Virginia. That's how you do things, is you find a balance, you make it bipartisan, and you ensure that you have government minimums with a free market insurance economy. Thank you. This question goes first to Denver. Um, what would you do if elected to deal with trade and tariffs? Well, that is a huge topic in the Fifth District. Um, trade and tariffs. So what's amazing about this also um, with trade and tariffs is I am in business and I would like to tell everybody right now that the tariffs are affecting our distillery. Uh, we're paying an extra $400 more or less for a tote. A tote is actually a fermentation chamber, a fermentation barrel, a big old metal barrel. And based on tariffs, we have to pay more right now. So as I go around the district, I tell people, like, hey, listen, you know, I've always been a free trade guy right? But I've also got a fair trade guy. So when I'm looking at both of these right now, I start looking at the specific examples we have in the 5th District. Number one, who, think, who here thinks tobacco farmers are getting screwed? Well, they are, right? Based on the tariffs in China. But if you talk to Timber and the guys that I've talked to, they're loving it. It's a great day for Timber. When you talk to Dairy, there's a balance. 
Most of them are worried about milk dumping or the federal milk management order system. When it comes to tariffs, it's really not affected them too much yet. But here's what one farmer told me, and it was pretty interesting when I talked to him. He said, hey, Denver. He goes, if it's short-term pain for long-term gain, I'll take it. Tariffs and free trade are pretty difficult to get around because there's, there's onesies and twosies within the 5th District that we have to, to, you know, we, we have to look at. I wish I could tell you right now, oh, it's always free trade, or it's always fair trade, or it's always protectionism. But there's people in here, and I've been down in the, you know, in the bottom 12 to 13 counties of the district. If I say NAFTA, they're probably going to either shoot at me or they're going to run me off their property, right? <laughs> that is actually the truth, right? So this renegotiated NAFTA for them, for Mexico, they're starting to see, hey, is something actually happening? So for me, it's a patience game as a businessman. I know for me that I have to sometimes invest in certain types of things for long-term gain, even if it might cost me. So I look at the tariff policy and I look at the trade policy. For me, is at what point is there a breaking point for farmers or at what point is there a breaking point for people that are on the wrong side of the tariffs right now? And why are the other people so happy about the tariffs? There's selective tariffs, there's all these things that we have to look at. So it's, this is my thing and it's the thing that I've been trying to look at as I go through this, is if there's any tariff that looks like a tax to the fifth district, where the short-term pain outduels the long-term gain, I will fight for it because my job is to serve the 5th District and those industries because agriculture is the number one industry in the 5th District. So when you're looking at things like that from a business perspective, you have to remember this. Everything that you do, and this is a thing that I'd like to bring to Congress, everything that you do, if you're going to invest in something like a sort of a, a we're going to actually make trade fair, you have to look at what the outcome is and what your profit and loss is as you go forward and to make sure that everybody that's affected by it has a free and fair play in this market economy. And if they don't, I have to fight for the fifth. And that's what I'll do. I have to go back to health care first because I don't think Denver and I agree on health care. He has stated on the record he wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act. That's what Tom Garrett voted for. And that means taking health care away from 23 million people. And it also means that those people who had pre-existing conditions who could not get health care, who could not get health insurance before the Affordable Care Act would be getting it in the neck once again. Right now, the Trump administration says that it is unconstitutional to give health care to people with pre-existing conditions to guarantee that they can be insured at a reasonable cost. They say it's unconstitutional. Denver supports the Trump administration. He has said on the record he supports Trump. And now let me go into, now let me just go into tariffs, which is these tariffs are Trump tariffs. And I find going around the district, um, I have a farm and I talk to farmers all the time and, w and they are getting killed by these tariffs. The, what's happening with the dairy farmers is the Mexicans are no longer buying American cheese, so therefore the big puddle of milk uh, in the United States is getting bigger and therefore the price is going down. Soybean farmers have told me that they, they are going to vote Democrat this year for the first time because of these tariffs and the fact that Trump clearly does not care about them. Now anybody who supports Trump to, to slide away from that and say, uh, oh well I'm not so sure about tariffs, maybe yes, maybe no. Personally, I am very opposed to these tariffs. And I think anyone with a brewery who has to worry about the cost of alum aluminum can, all of this affects the 5th District very deeply. So let's get rid of these Trump tariffs. They are, as from my perspective, completely insane, and they are a tax. This question goes first to Leslie. What would you do, if elected, to address the issue of gerrymandering? <laughs> Well, I, I think we have a huge movement going on right now in the state of Virginia, at the state level, to um, solve the issue of gerrymandering. The 5th District is a very gerrymandered district. But what I have found in the 5th, and I'm switching, let, let's, let, let's 
the state is going to do a great job on gerrymandering. They are going to solve this issue. I, I think it's a huge movement and people are very behind it. So I really have confidence in our state legislators who will deal with this. I will say in the fifth, however, we talk about it as being very gerrymandered. We still have more committed Democrats in the fifth than Republicans by about 4,000 people. The issue is getting out the vote. And I also find that throughout this district, people often say, well, it's so different in the North than in the South. This is not true. The interests of people throughout this district are very, very similar, no matter what issue you're talking about, whether it's health care, whether it's environment, whether it's education, whether it's uh, uh, fair living wage, all of these things, whether it's the fact that we need to fill the jobs that we have. We have 2,500 open jobs south side. And one of the main reasons we have that is because people cannot pass a drug test. So let's look at how this district is a uniform district and let's, uh, let's give the gerrymandering, the job for solving Virginia's gerrymandering issues to the state. Actually, my, my rebuttal to Leslie is we just must be talking to different voters. Um, gerrymandering. Here's what we have. If, I don't think gerrymandering could definitely couldn't be a problem just because we have a district that looks like a dragon riding a scooter. I mean, I don't know if you guys have looked at this, but um, it's a massive district that sort of curls around down the middle, uh, 21 counties, and anybody, I think, and I honestly believe that's correct, anybody who says gerrymandering is not an issue is intellectually dishonest whether it's Republicans or Democrats. And that's why you have the fight for the seats that we see right now. I am excited about what the state is doing about gerrymandering. The Republicans put in something fantastic right now based on the court case in order to try to make this a much better place as far as non-gerrymandered districts. And what they're talking about is do we make a district R plus five or D plus five? We have to have districts that are what, 710 to 730,000 people? How do we do that? Do we do it geographically in massive squares? Do we look at the voting population and try to break it out that way? How is it going to be bipartisan? If we build a bipartisan committee, who picks the committees? Is it the Democrats or the Republicans? How do we do this? So I think right now, and what we've seen in some states, is the majorities are giving the minority party more power and more weighted vote in order to draw the districts. And they're doing this, why? Mutual benefit. They're tired of mutually assured destruction, right? So they want to make sure that if they go into any type of gerrymandering, that if they're in the minority party, that they don't have the same issues that they had as the majority. So obviously, gerrymandering, gerrymandering is something that we have to look at. I do think you're gonna see improvements in Virginia. It's something that I despise, and I'll tell you this, I don't care if the district is gerrymandered or not, right? If it's more Democrat or more Republican, I would've run anyway. I think at some point, and, and that's something I was talking about Leslie beforehand, we do have opposing viewpoints on how to fix things, but you are looking at two people who have never run before. Ever. And, we, and I think this is the great thing about what we're doing right now, is that we're in this huge district where Leslie has done, where she's, there's 4,000 more Democrats, where we're looking at so many independents and so many conservatives. I don't know the exact outlay of who's who, and I really don't give a rats. What I care about is I tell the truth that I'm transparent. So gerrymandering doesn't matter to me. I'll walk anywhere, I'll talk to anybody, you can come have a drink with me. I'm right in the center of the dragon, so come and talk to me. Thank you very much. This topic goes first to Denver. Immigration policy. Yeah, immigration's pretty interesting. You know, as you go around the 5th District, there's a couple things that I've looked at. There's sort of three things that I look at as we go forward. Number one is we have to have a secure border. That's the first thing that we have to do. And as I go around talking in the district, I'm like, listen, if we're looking at a secure border, I need to know the problems that you have in the district when it comes to immigration. For me, and what I've talked to farmers, um, especially those who have H-2A workers, is the amount of regulatory issues they have on the legal migration side or the legal immigration side. So as I talked to them, I said, there's three things that I, you know, I get out of the farmers as they're talking to me. Number one, we have massive labor shortages in the district. We do have, as has already been said, we do have more jobs than we have people. We have a superheated economy, and there's no way that we can fill those jobs. 
So when you start looking at this, you say, how do we actually fill some of those labor jobs, whether it's dairy, whether it's tobacco, whether it's fruit pickers? So if you go to talk to farms with somebody, uh, I, I went to a farm in Nelson, 105 H-2A workers. I don't know if you guys know H-2A, and you guys can go and take a look at it, but these are migrant workers that are working out of the culture. He started going over everything he has to go through. For instance, he said the Department of Labor, Department of Labor charges him $75 per, per migrant worker that's on his farm to drive on his own farm. I don't know if you guys done the math, 105 times 75, that's a lot for math in public, right? So you're looking at what, 76, 7,700 bucks, right, per year. When you look at what he has to do for the housing inspections, it's absolutely onerous. So what you're looking at is we have to streamline immigration and legal migration here in the 5th District. It have to have, has to happen based on our labor shortages. So the first thing is just to secure the border. Physical, secure the border, or passive detection or passive anything that you're looking at because of the border ops that I did there, there are ways to fill in the gaps with technology, with collaborative technology. The second thing is we make sure that we have H2A and we fix it, or we pass H2C. And we look at touchback policies. We look at the policies that can help the farmers and more migrant workers to get in here. We streamline the process and take away those regulatory, regulatory hurdles. So here's what I asked on the third thing. So here we got, we got strong border security, right? We have H2A, H2C, and I'll fight for H2C, right? The best thing that I can do to streamline some of these procedures. The third thing is E-Verify. And now the farmer said, if you can fix this stuff, we're happy with E-Verify. If we have a strong border, we know who's here, we can use E-Verify, and it's gonna take a couple years to perfect E-Verify because of the data challenges. But what we're looking at is we're looking at a common sense approach to immigration to help people, to make sure we secure the borders, because I just, I get a good chance to look at criminal activity on the border, I get to look at drug interdiction, I get to look at state-sponsored terrorism, all the things that come across the borders, and those borders are not just on the southern borders, but it's also in Florida, and it's also in Canada. We look at all the borders. So I think we can come up with really even a bipartisan solution to immigration, especially if we secure the border, we ensure that we streamline immigration, and we institute E-Verify for employers. Thank you. First, I want to jump back to gerrymandering for one moment. Um, Denver said it was intellectually dishonest to say that the district is not gerrymandered. There is no question that this district is one of the most gerrymandered districts in America. It is gerrymandered to benefit the Republicans. The good news is that if we get out the vote, we win, even in a heavily gerrymandered district. That's intellectually honest. Immigration is one of the most shameful issues that we have now on the table. This administration is treating people who are coming to this country as criminals. We are told endlessly that this country is being infested. The language is truly appalling. Right now we still have hundreds of children on the border and elsewhere who have been separated from their parents in a program that is, is, is absolutely outrageous. And the fact that uh, my opponent didn't even mention this and hasn't talked about this, I find disturbing. We must never, ever allow something like this to happen again, period. district is the engine of the fifth is agriculture as everyone in this room knows Madison is an agricultural county we have huge numbers of immigrant labor in this district who's milking the cows three times a day who's plucking the chickens who is taking care of older people in the fifth these are the immigrants what is exciting about the immigration issue in the fifth is that when you go to every agricultural organization and say, what is your top priority? It's always immigration reform. We can build a really strong coalition, not just with those Im immigrant advocates in Charlottesville who are addressing things on a moral issue, but we can bring in all the agricultural interests and we need comprehensive immigration reform. It is not just a question 
of uh, turning a seasonal visa into a um, year-round visa. It is comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship. This is something that even, you know, it's interesting going back and looking at old footage of what different um, administrations felt about this. The person who felt very strongly about this is Ronald Reagan. Path to citizenship. Thank you. This next question goes first to Leslie. If elected, what would you do to address education issues? The other night, uh, Bobby Scott came to Danville to be with me at a big rally we had down there. And it was very, very exciting to think that if we can flip the House of Representatives, Bobby Scott will be chairman of the Education and Workforce Committee. He will be the one making decisions and urging people on to improve our education system desperately in need of help. Fortunately, both houses of Congress rejected the terrible demands of Betsy DeVos in the Department of Education. She wanted to make massive cuts, and both Republicans and Democrats together rejected that, and I was very, very happy to see that. Ed education in the fifth, we need to address it on many levels. One, pre-K. We need universal pre-K, and that is because so many of the differences of of black and white, uh, rich and poor in the fifth, can be solved in pre-K. That is where kids really get prepared and so that they don't jump into kindergarten and still, you know, once you get into kindergarten, if you can't find your way, then that goes on forever. So pre-K, 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 also um, our schools are starved for funds, for example, for counselors, for special education, it's, it's too narrow. The, what kids have to walk through to get that is too narrow, and therefore we end up with one problem, which is school-to-prison pipeline, which I would really like to address. And also, beyond that, I believe in free community college. Two years, free community college. <laughs> give an opportunity to those kids who haven't quite found the path in high school to find it in community college and in community college to have those choices, to, to be able to uh, go to a course so you know how to become an entrepreneur, start a business. That's really important to a lot of communities. They want to be able to learn how to start a business in community college, not to mention a trade if you're interested. Um, and I think that also a crisis we have in this country is student loans. We have a generation who are suffering. In Virginia, the average student debt is now $30,000. And for those going to um, Averitt, for example, in Danville, it's $35,000. We must address this in several ways. There are several bills. I have, I, I, my time limit is up, but there are several bills on the table to address student loan issues and making it fairer for our students. Education in the fifth. Um, I had my education here at the fifth at UVA. No Hokies hold that against me. But when you're looking at Virginia, uh, you look at the education system that is here, there's a few things that I believe uh, could definitely help the education system. Number one, I believe in school choice. I think when we look at, even looking at countries like Finland, I mean, you're starting to look at things where school choice is becoming what we need to do in order to make sure that we hold underperforming schools accountable. I think we also got to let teachers teach in their districts. I really don't see any way that the federal government can know what the fifth district needs for their students. So my, the question for me is this, why are we linking funding to SOL scores? And even to that point, right? Even, and even to that, why are we doing this type of testing for youngsters? You know, I, you know, I get to talk to teachers because, well, I had kids in school. It's great, right? I went to school. So when you talk to this, their, their biggest beef is that why do we have these mandates connected to funding 
where we're just teaching to test it, right? We have, we have this money that seems to be ill-spent. We have a bureaucracy that doesn't react to us. Why can't we do this? How about homeschooling? Why don't we allow the freedom to homeschool? Not only the freedom to homeschool, right? But there is no reason why there not, shouldn't be tax deductions for homeschoolers based on the money that they pay. The great thing about liberty and the great thing about being American is that we, we not only deserve to have these choices, we should be able to make these choices for our children. When it comes to college, when it comes to trade schools, when you look at the technical acumen that you need for what's coming up now, I mean, there's, there's incredible stuff happening. If you look at solar, they're using data transmission on solar for internet using Li-Fi. You have so many things happening right now in advanced manufacturing that's absolutely unbelievable, and we could do that here. But we need the trade schools to support it. There's no reason that the trade schools can't be supported like the liberal arts schools or the other schools that we have with four-year institutions. So as you look at these things, why aren't there incentives for students to go to trade schools? Not everybody needs to go to college. For me, it took me a while to go to college. I know you're probably stunned by that with my incredible talent. But if you talk about my first three years in community college, I had a 1.1 GPA. And um, my wife was with me at the time, and she knows it didn't go very well. So I had to join the military to mature. But the great thing was I went into the military, and I went to school full-time at night, paid for it myself, so I could get two associate's degrees, then I get my bachelor's degree. That's what we have to look at. It's not just college. It's not just school. It's the choice of every person in the district to send their child where they want to send them and to have that freedom and liberty for education in any spectrum that they wish to have it in. Thank you. Tax reform. Your views on tax reform. Love it. So, um, so for us, um, when we're looking at tax reform um, and how that's up companies, there's there's something pretty incredible that's happening right now. So, if you look at all the metrics in the fifth district, every single job area is growing except one, and that's government, and that makes me very very happy. So, if you see manufacturing growing. You see the jobs growing and you look at the percentage drop actually in, in unemployment, you start to get pretty excited. You know, for us, we talk about balances. We talk about everything that we do, right, and every piece of money that we keep in our pocket. For me, it's been pretty amazing when you read that the CBO report that individual tax revenues are up at $105 billion. But you look at corporate tax revenues and they're down $71 billion. So there is a slight delta in growth in tax revenue based on the tax, tax cuts. But we're getting this stuff out there um, that, hey, you know, we're going to grow, what, 895 to 1 trillion in debt this year, which is a percentage of GDP is higher than the last three or four years, right? Now, we've had higher than that in other administrations as a percentage of GDP, but it's too high for me. And what I see right now is that we have tax cuts and all this economic growth, what they're, they're what, forecasting 4.6, 4.7% growth. The question that I have for people out there right now is, do you feel better now? Do you want to go back? Do you want the taxes raised again? Is that what you want? Do you want to go back there? Or do you want somebody in there who goes in there as a deficit hawk and says, stop the spending? Enough of the spending and enough of those things that are destroying our republic because lobbyists and government get together and they take and take and take and never get back. I will make sure the tax reform does not sunset. I will make sure of that. The growth in the companies that I see and who I talk to, you finally see hope again. Right, we're what, 3% unemployment in the 5th District? 3%, right? So when you start looking at these things in some of these counties, what is Madison, 2.3, 2.4%? So when you start looking at these things, your question you have to ask yourself, where is the problem? It's not in tax reform, not at all. You should be keeping all the money that you can. It's in a government that has spent itself into oblivion and needs people in there looking at how that spending is actually happening, looking at the waste that's going on in every single department, every single department, and have somebody that audits those department and finds that money and say, this is American taxpayer money and we have to control it and we have to take care of it. Thank you very much. Well, we have an administration who have just added $1.9 trillion to the deficit. 
That is a lot of money, and uh, it's been given away to corporations and to the wealthy who do not need that money. And our grandchildren are going to be paying for it. So the idea of, of uh, that there's fiscal hawks up there in the Republican Party is quite ridiculous right now. They love to spend money, and they are spending it to benefit corporations and not to benefit you. And There are a great number of people who are not benefiting from that tax bill. Their taxes will go up. And also, those people who are not major corporations and who are not um, the wealthy, who are uh, receiving some small benefit, that will end. It is temporary. And if it is not temporary, then a lot more will go on to the deficit. They are borrowing to pay for this. They are borrowing for this giveaway. If I wanted to have a giveaway like that, I think I could find something else to give it away to. For example, how about all those people with student loan debt? That's 1.5 trillion. Why would you, if you want to waste that much money, why waste it on corporations? I don't see the point, and uh, most people in, in the corporate world, they know they don't need that money, and there have been huge numbers of stock buybacks. It's a completely uh, ridiculous approach to tax. And now, what the fiscal hawks are gonna wanna do, having blown all this money, is that they wanna take it from Medicare. They wanna take it from Medicaid, and they wanna take it from Social Security to the tune of 500 billion from Medicare, 1.5 trillion from Medicaid, and 4 trillion from Social Security. No, they must not be allowed to do this. to protect Social Security and Medicare, and I intend to protect Social Security and Medicare. This question goes first to Leslie. Agriculture in the 5th District. What would you do if elected? The 5th District is full of small farms. Over 75% of the farms in the 5th are owned by people who also do something else because they're not making enough money from their farms. We need to tailor the farm bill to fight for those things that farmers in the 5th need rather than uh, their, uh, the big farms of the Midwest. For example, one thing that farmers really want is conservation funding. That is extremely important to, um, to farmers in the fifth, and I will fight very, very hard to increase that conservation farming. There are subcommittees that deal specifically with that. Also, um, we have a lot of exporters in the fifth, so you wanna make sure that, um, that people who are exporting timber to China, for example, get what they need for those exports, and we hope that the Chinese will not slap tariffs on timber, because that would be very bad for the fifth. But I think there are a number of things. Uh, the main thing is that this administration doesn't seem to really care much about farmers, in the sense that on the tariffs, for example, Trump uh, put a little band-aid on that, saying, well, we're gonna give 18 billion to farmers. That's very nice, but they've already spent more than that, and losing those contracts, which will then go to the Brazilians, or to the Canadians, or to some other country, ruins farmers, because it takes a long time to get a contract like that, and it's hard to get it back. Yeah. So fighting for farmers will be a top priority of mine, and um, I, I look forward to it. Um, on the last one, and just uh, as a rebut, I just think it's um, I just think it's two different worldviews um, about taxes. Maybe it's where I came from, and 
When I talk to people that have $60 and they have $1,000 more or $2,000 more in their pocket for the tax cuts, I see real joy and real opportunity. Um, when you come from Medicare, when you come from being poor, uh, my mom is sitting here, when you come from a cardboard box with a sheet on it, when you come from nothing, $60 a week could be a lifesaver. My first check was $984 for the month. So it must be just a different life view when you're talking to the people that I'm talking to in the 5th District. And they're telling me these tax cuts have helped them so much. You know, we're sitting up here, and it's not even a political thing. I don't have to talk to you all. I don't have to talk to Leslie. I don't have to talk to the moderator. All I have to talk to is the voters of the 5th District. So as we're going through this and we're talking jobs, and we're talking tax reform, we're talking people keeping more money, I think what you're seeing is you're going to have people vote for more money in their pocket and less giveaways. And that's the thing, I think that's the difference between Republicans and Democrats in some ways. And I'm not even saying some things we agree on, is I don't believe we should be giving tax money that you earn to anyone. That's the first thing. The second, use the money that you have in your pocket. I ain't giving things away. Number two, <coughs> agriculture. When you look at agriculture in this district, what do I hear? And, and Leslie and I are on the road a lot. What do I hear? I hear regulatory burden. I hear labor shortages, right, for the first time. I hear people actually internally, they're starting to sell more. For me, I get to talk to farmers every day because I buy grain from them. I do. We go through three tons a day. So what I see is happiness in the people as we're buying more grain, and they're seeing an uptick in grain sales. That's when you have breweries and distilleries come out of the woodwork to buy more as you see manufacturing go up, as you see growth go up. If you look at Silverback itself and some of the areas around the 151 trail where I'm at, our growth is up 42% over the last year and a half based on people coming in with more money to spend. I see the economy because I'm in it. The farmers see the economy because they're in it. And when you're talking about agriculture, let's talk about Department of Labor. Let's talk about every farmer saying, for the love of goodness, Denver, please get the Department of Labor out of our pocket and get the Department of Agriculture in here because the Department of Labor is killing us because they're anti-business and anti-agriculture. When I talk to people, they're like, when we talk to anybody from the Virginia Employment Commission or anybody else, we have multiple, multiple regulations that we have to follow that's adding cost of what we're doing or we could make money. Denver, for the love of goodness, help us with our labor shortages. Help us with our migrant workers. Why can't we get American kids in here to work? Where is that talent? That's what I hear when I'm on the fifth. So everybody just laughed, oh my goodness. Now we have a joint Democrat-Republican issue here. So that's what we're doing. That's what I think about agriculture in the fifth. Thank you very much. This topic was first to Denver. Uh, the opioid crisis. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's anybody in here that hasn't been affected by the opioid crisis. Um, and there's multiple things. I think just, uh, gosh, was it just this week, I think there was a bipartisan bill passed 99 to 1. I think it was an opioid crisis bill that actually adds money to rehabilitation, law enforcement, um, especially those trying to come off that awful, that awful addiction of opioids. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, I've got to see some of the things that are going on as far as opioid addiction. So I'm um, looking at the CBP, uh, Custom and Border Patrol. There's a few things that they're very afraid of. Um, number one is the massive amount of fentanyl that's coming across the border. Also, they're worried about with all the opioids and the synthetic opioids, especially out of out of the Joint Interagency Task Force down in Florida, they just can't stop the flow of drugs that are coming to the United States. And here are some of the issues that they have. Number one, collaboration. Again, they don't have any collaborative data. They don't have any way to actually do the type of intelligence work that they need to do. But the big thing for them is they're just underfunded on the border. I mean, these are professionals. If you look at the Customs and Border Patrol, you look at anybody that's actually in CBP, these are people that are underfunded, they're tired, they're incredibly professional. And I think at some point we have to have some kind of security measures to stop the drugs that are coming across right now. Also, some other things that you look about is there's other things happening out there, and I don't know if you guys are aware of. How do we stop these things with the opioid addiction? China. China actually uses cryptocurrencies, and they mail opioids into the United States through our mail service, whether it's UPS, whether it's a regular mail. And there's no way to track opioids or cryptocurrency trans transitions or, or actually um, any transactions that are actually transnational. So there's so many things that we're trying to do to stop the opioid crisis, but when you're in the Department of Defense or when you're in law enforcement, you have to look at everything as rehabilitation, as law enforcement, but also in how we actually secure our borders. Those are those three things. I think at some point, and I think this might 
rock the house a little bit, but I think at some point we got to look at marijuana as an exit drug. When you look at opioids, right, and what they do to people, I think you have many more people that have died of overdose of opioids than they have from marijuana. I'll tell you that. We've done a lot, a lot of research on this. So I think at some point, somewhere, somebody has to say, to stop this opioid addiction with all the money that we're throwing out, with the bipartisan support for these bills, of the damage that it's wreaking across the entire 5th District, but also, what, what is the 5th District? For every 100 people in the 5th District, there's 64 opioid prescriptions. Think about that real quick. For every 100 people, there's 64 opioid prescriptions. So you think we might have a problem with the health industry too? You think we might have a problem with people that maybe are over-prescribing based on the kind of money that they're getting back door from health pharma and, and lobbies? That's the thing that I've been trying to fight, and that's why I'm here. It's not because of some political maelstrom. It's because at some point we have to have common sense in government, we have to have bipartisan solutions, and know that there's other things that we can do to fight this horrible epidemic. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to agriculture for one moment. You were describing um, farmers selling you grain. Um, Denver, if things are going so well, why do you want to move your operation to Pennsylvania? This, oh, hold on. No, you can, we you just can ask answer. the question because it's going to be a very bad answer for you, but go ahead. But I, I, I think last year, you and your wife made it very clear that um, you, you have now opened Silverback in Pennsylvania, that you want to uh, have perhaps uh, 14 to 19 jobs available for people in Pennsylvania, that you want to bring the Silverback spirit to the Poconos. Um, that means that you're really not fully invested in the 5th District of Virginia. Because I think that uh, if you were, then you would concentrate more on what's going on in Nelson County than what's going on in Pennsylvania. You can answer this question when you have part of your three minutes coming up. But also, in terms of the opioid issue, the biggest problem with opioids is not border patrols. We have been fighting a war on drugs forever. And believe me, have I covered that war in Colombia, in Central America, on the border. That's not what's going to solve our opioid crisis. What is, is bringing Big Pharma into court, as they're doing in New York, in Montana, and around the country, to have a push opioid on all of us. Uh, also, the insurance companies made it very easy to get opioids much cheaper and much more expensive to get other drugs which are less addict addictive, and that has to be flipped. So I think uh, what we really need to concentrate on with the opo opioid issue is not what's coming from China, not what's on the border, but what is happening right here in the United States. Let's get those companies who have been responsible for pushing these pills, and let's, let's get them to answer for that. How about some accountability? Thank you. Because there was a direct um, issue raised in this question, I think it's appropriate that each candidate will get one minute for dealer's choice before we get to the final answer. You can say whatever you like by way of response or in another topic. And we'll go first to you. This is 60 seconds, kind of a lightning round, if you will, uh, to, uh, to deal with whatever issue you want to raise before the final commission. I think I just get to answer the question. That's pretty much it, right? For me. Okay. Because uh, I don't get three minutes correct. So here's the deal. So um, I know you drove down from Washington, so I'm going to explain economics to you real quick. So here's, here's what we got. <laughs> Questions. Does Jack Daniels sell his products in other states? Yes. Yeah. Maker's Mark? Yes. Basil Hayden? Yes. Yeah. Templeton? Yes. Yeah. Belvedere? Yes. Yeah. Tito's? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, by the way, when you actually make stuff, you got to use more grains. So for expanding into multiple states, and I can then make a maximum of 800,000 bottles per year, and right now I'm at 80,000 per year, based on the 54% uh, tax bill I have, 
What if I can actually maximize production and use that 800,000 pounds for 800,000 bottles and buy more grains from farmers, which actually helps the farmers in the fifth district because that's how distribution works. So to ask those kind of questions on a business way is this is how business works. You grow Virginia as your agricultural base and you actually do a hub and spoke system and spread it around the country. Thank you very much. Denver. And let me point out that I've been voting in this district four years longer than you have. You arrived in 2012. And, uh, yes? Yeah, um, 1996, we were actually residents here. By the way, I was a resident with my father starting in 1978 in Fluvanna County, which I think is in the 5th District. Also in 1980. Wait, uh, sorry, this is my 60 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am a very happy resident of Rappahannock, and uh, I do have a property in Washington, which I pay non-resident tax. Thank you very much, Denver. Uh, and uh, to talk about our family as a blow-in here, when I've been in Rappahannock for nearly 20 years now, is so deeply insulting. And uh, just, just so you know that, and uh, in terms of you talking about farmers' issues as a farmer, I think I can d discuss those issues too. So uh, uh, I appreciate. Um, so how about this, Leslie, Miss Cooper? How about how about how about I start talking? How about this? No, no. I was going to say a nice thing. I apologize. Well, how about yeah, we have you say so. it in your three-minute closing statement? The, uh, so we'll get to the closing statements in a moment. Uh, Denver goes first with those. And, but before I do that, I do want to thank everyone for putting this together. It's really a difficult process, particularly in a sprawling district like this, to organize schedules and make things work. And so I really think that it's important to, to recognize the, the great effort that's gone into uh, putting this together. The Madison County School District, the Rural Madison Organization, uh, the uh, excellent timekeepers we've had tonight. Uh, there are just so many people who've made this a successful opportunity to have a conversation about the future of this country. And so I thank you as well, being civil, uh, you should give yourself a moment. With that, we'll turn to closing statements. Denver, your three minutes. Thank you. I I want to thank the crowd. You guys have actually been awesome. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk, thank you to the moderator. I appreciate that very much. Thank you to my family. Uh, thank you for everybody here who participates in this process. Um, tonight, I mean, there's really three things that are, you know, big topics that we talked about. If you talk about healthcare, you talk about immigration, you talk about taxes. I think we see as just sort of two different views as we go forward, and those views are somebody who believes that the individual is the one who makes all the decisions in their lives or should be. One of the things the government has 